sense through all the noise out there today. Consider taking an advertisement out on 100 and Chamber Radio, WHCR DB, the voice of business. Contact the Chamber today at 908 782 7115 or give us an email at info at hundred-chamber.org. Uh, hi, welcome back. Uh, this is uh, Jim Minadio, um, host of the Hack 100 and Radio Show. I'm the president of Zero Surge, manufacturer quality, power quality filters that are used for surge protecting sensitive electronics. With Zero Surge, you have peace of mind that your electronics are kept safe. For today's show, we ha- will cover some news of the world of technology and innovation. Uh, that you may not have read about. And my guest today is one of the co-owners of the Lone Eagle Brewing Company, Bob King. Say hello, Bob. Hello, Jim. Oh, wait. It would help. Say it again. Hey, hello, Jim. There you go. If I turn your mic up, that helps. Again, you can tell I'm new at this. Um, and always, I'll end the show with some historical innovation story. And since tomorrow is 4th of July, it'll be a uh, founding father's feel to it. So so let's get started. Um, so some news. Uh, as most of you may have heard already, um, you know, if you follow business news, uh, Lee Iacocca passed away at uh, 94 uh, Tuesday morning, according to his family. Um, little things that I didn't know that uh, Lee Iacocca and I guess Bob didn't know either. He was a um, on the founding team for uh, the Ford Mustang with Ford. Uh, he did become president of Ford uh, in December 1970, and then he got fired with a, in a dispute with uh, Henry Ford II. And so then he joined uh, then struggling Chrysler. And, um, you know, for, for, I know Bob's probably old, I'm old enough to remember even when uh, Chrysler was gonna go bankrupt and the federal government guaranteed loans to keep them afloat, um, you know, similar to what happened with GM recently in 2008, I think it was. And um, so Lee Iacocca turned the company around. He used the his slogan was, if you can find a better car, buy it. That was the tagline of the TV commercials. And um, so he, one of his big first cars that he got Chrysler out of the slump with was the K car, which I remember was like a variety of different kind of very simple looking sedans. They were a lot smaller than they used to be, right? Yeah, and I, I, if I remember, and this is going back a few years, um, what was interesting about the K car if I recall, the quality was maybe skeptical <laughs> at best. Yeah. But the warranty he put behind it was far better than anyone in the marketplace. And he decided that's going to help make it a differentiator, right? And so right. that's what made that such a, a great selling car because people said, well, I'm getting 100000 on my drivetrain. Well, how often does a drivetrain fail? Right. right. But people heard that and, and it just got them all. Right, right. Exactly, exactly. I remember that too, like thinking – because I think uh, my parents – uh, I remember my dad had a Dodge Polara, which was like this big, one of the last 70s big boat kind of cars. You know, we used to like camp at it. I mean, it was so, I mean, at least we felt like we'd go to like drive in movies and like sleep on the roof because it was so big. Um, and then we would, uh, my mom got a Dodge Omni, I remember. Well, you guys were a Dodge family. Then. Yeah, so wow. we were a Dodge family, I guess. And, uh, so that was also right when the K car came out was the Dodge Omni was also his take on like the VW Rabbit or, you know, the small Toyota Tercel of the day, you know, it was like you got 30 miles to the gallon, yeah. you know, ooh. But back then that was you know? big deal, right? <laughs> Well, you only have to go to the gas station, you know, twice a week instead of every <laughs> other day, um, stuff like that. And then, um, so then his other big uh, innovation was the minivan. I mean, minivan vans existed, uh, you know, you had conversion vans, you had all these kind of things, you had the VW bus and those kind of vehicles, but he really made the minivan iconic with the Dodge Caravan and the, the Chrysler, it was just called the minivan, It right? was the minivan, and, yeah. and you think about, at that time, what was so revolutionary was the fact that it was lower to the ground, it was made for families with kids, women loved it, right? They could easily right. put their kids in there, get them in and out of their car seats, Plenty of space in the back. The door was easy to open on the side. A lot of little things they did that yeah. really made it extremely, I would say, more family or even more women friendly that just exploded. Yeah, because back then, you know, if you had a big family car, it was a station wagon. Right. And so the back seat was always like, how do you sit? And, and you're sitting it, facing backwards. Yeah, and the kids well, are, I remember the kid yeah. riding in the way back of the seat. Yeah, you yeah. can't do that today, but we thought it was fun. Who gets yeah. to ride in the back, right? No exactly. seat belts, nothing. You know, and it, it, uh, you know, it had a 
command of the road and things like that exactly but it also acted like a car because it was small enough to get into parking spaces it wasn't a these big cargo van type things so so that's uh so one more on Lee because what was yeah. his, his business slogan which was I'll remember it to the sake because it was yeah. really popular he was right. really a, a, a leader uh, and, and he taught many many business lessons and I learned this in my years in the corporate world but do you recall what his what his uh, three things he said Lead, uh, follow, or, or get, get out, out of the way. way. Yeah, that, okay. I, yeah. I'm pretty sure that was lead. That, that, yeah, yeah. That that is definitely one of his slogans. And then um, later on in life, found out um, he actually did invest in a uh, electric vehicle car company in 1999 called EV Global Motors. Um, but then he ended up, I guess, as he got older, doing more charitable work. So he did some stuff with um, uh, what was it? For, oh, Ellis Island. Because remember, he did the Statue of Liberty. He was on that committee to renovate the oh, Statue I, I of Liberty. Wasn't aware of that, no. Yeah, I remember that because I, I I remember when they had the big anniversary. Um, and then he also helped to do the, all that whole restoration with Ellis Island and how they have it a big park now. And yeah, so yeah. that was um, also something that he did. So he led a pretty long life and a pretty eventful one. So good for him. It's very successful. Yep. Okay, so moving on to the next story. Um, just a quick one out of Anchorage, Alaska, actually. Um, it's kind of near to me because I used to work for a company that sold uh, drones. And so uh, that's one of the topics you know I I'm, know a lot about. I know about how they're made, how the evolution of them. And um, you know one of the big issues is how do we legislate them? Because you can go to the store, buy them, but they can do just as many things as you know important things like fire rescue, um, delivering medication during disasters, things like that. And People are worried about their privacy. This thing can fly over your house. You know, it's it can just hover over your house, take video. You know, what are the laws? And so the problem is, up until you know we had drones, everything that was air related was federally regulated. So it didn't matter if you were in New Jersey, Maryland, you know, California. The FAA was in charge of the airspace. Um, with the drones, they've kind of relinquished some of their control and some of the states then started creating laws. So there's this group called the Uniform Law Commission, which it's interesting, somebody should do an expose on them because they're a group of lawyers that get together and write legislation and then send it to the states and say, here, this is a legal uh, law that we want you to promote or this is something, you know, you're interested in drones, this is, we agree, this is how we wouldn't sue you over it basically. So it's almost like they're this like think tank of lawyers that create laws, and um, you know they're not elected officials or anything, but they do create the laws that our elected officials then supposedly create. Well, hopefully those are well intentioned and good laws. Well, first. that's <laughs> the theory, obviously, <laughs> and that's the thing with drones. There's a lot of good intention uses for it, and so they've actually finally come up with some set of guidelines. Um, the one that was unworkable was the 200 foot line in the sky. So they're basically saying up until 200 feet, you could have 200 feet above your property as your airspace. And it's like, it's almost impossible to enforce that. Well, yeah. Because then I could just put the drone at 205 and then still take pictures. Right. So, you know, um, but it, most of it is to do with, you know, obviously the privacy, but also noise. That's another issue. The noise, I think, I don't know if that addresses any of the uh, federal aviation stuff or if that's a separate entire. Because uh, I don't know if you recall, there's a lot of geofencing and firmware that's supposed to be baked into a lot of these drones to prevent them from flying into areas like airports where it becomes very Well, the, on the good ones there are, but there's ones you can buy that have no fencing. So, yeah. you know, I could go to xheli.com and buy a drone for 40 bucks that takes 720p video. And, and fly it over so your you're house. you're not going to be able to pop the firmware out and put something else in its right. place. There's, and, there is no firmware yeah. in it. I can guarantee you because I, I, I have one. I just know. <laughs> it just doesn't exist. So um, so look for that. It, it's probably going to start hitting states soon. Um, and then they'll start adopting it. Uh, the next article is a company in New York. It's called Pavilion, but they spell it P-V-I-L-I-O-N. Uh, as in uh, photovoltaic, so it's a solar company. And what they're doing is they're putting solar into fabrics. And now think about that. If you have, you know, I talked last week about Musk doing solar on the roof and finally getting certification uh, from the housing groups to um, certify his product. Imagine if it's on a soft fabric, what you can do. 
So this guy, so it's this little company, and so they can't just suddenly create all this different product. So their issue is how do you create products and then work with innovative companies that are already doing things, like say a tent manufacturer. So you want to put a solar, so you know, you're having your Lone Eagle, you know, brew fest in Atlantic City, and you have your tent outside, you could run power off the tent. Right. Why not? I'm thinking, I love the hike, right? Imagine hiking and charging your, yeah. your, your iPhone at the same time. Well, that's what they're saying. They, they even have like jackets that are solar jackets. So you're walking, you know, your phone's getting charged by your solar jacket. Sure. Yeah. You know, um, or just any soft fabric. So, you know, umbrella, well, obviously, yeah, umbrella, beach umbrellas, um, you know, all that thing. So. And if they provide UV protection, now you got a double bonus, right? So you get right. protected from the rays and you're, get, you're getting energy from the exactly. rays at the same time. So um, let's see. So we have one other, one other story real quick before the, ne the break, um, and that's, Right locally to our uh, Assemblyman's Wicker, I guess the second time I've mentioned him, um, he is advocating for three bills um, for net neutrality. So, in, you know, if you follow net neutrality, uh, you know that under the current federal administration, um, you know, the Trump administration, the Federal Communication Commission changed the rules and are allowing ISPs, internet service providers, to engage in content-based discrimination. And it's you know big deal. A lot of people are upset, and basically it means that Verizon can charge you more if you want to watch Netflix. You know, since Netflix is thirty percent of the internet traffic. So or, or throttle your bandwidth. Or throttle or right? slow it down it if, right if it's if it's causing too much headache if, on their network. If it's, yeah, and they'll say, well, if you want to watch our stations, watch on our preferred yeah. network, and and so there. Yeah, exactly. the, the, that whole thing. I'm not sure how it got passed. There was a lot of people against it. And it just right. Seemed like well, it's up to three commissioners to vote on it is what it ends up being. And so Sounded like a lobbyist one on that one. Yeah, so, so Zwicker is trying to do an interesting approach. Is he's trying to create a state law that would negate net you Didn't know, to Cal create I net I think traffic. California, right after that came out, I think they were one of the first states that says, yeah, it, right. this doesn't apply to California, right? Right, so, so the thing is, I don't know how you're going to apply this because these are federal, you know, national companies. So I don't know how it's going to play out. It's obviously going to go to court. And I think they're doing it as a strategy of saying, okay, please sue us. Let's go to the Supreme Court. Then they'll overrule, make it net neutrality. and then Well, yeah, this becomes interesting. Where, where, when does the federal government extend its, its reach too far, right? We say that right. even here locally, right? When does the right. state extend its reach too right, exactly. far? And so if they were able to back off, can they impose it at the state level and say, no, our state says you're not allowed to do that? So. I would think any of the ISPs in a particular state, they would have to lift those restrictions if it got approved at the state level. Yeah. Um, that, that's interesting. Okay, so uh, let's take a quick commercial break, and then we'll be right back with uh, Bob King. We'll talk more about his uh, brewery and everything that he's been working on. This is Georgine Trinkle. I want to invite you to listen to Hot and Hundred in every Monday from 4 to 5 p.m. You'll be treated to discussions on hot topics every week. Hot and Hundred in provides a more in-depth look at issues that are happening right now. You can catch the show live and call in on what matters to you. Make sure to download the podcast to catch up on all our hot topics. You're listening to WHCRDB, HuntertonChamberRadio.com. Brought to you by the Hunterdon County Chamber of Commerce, the voice of business. Did you know that one in five people are affected by mental illness? NAMI Hunterdon is the locally affiliate for NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. We are all volunteers, and all our programs are free of charge. We offer Family to Family, a 12-week course for families that have an adult member with mental illness. Another popular program is In Our Own Voice, where individuals who are living with mental illness discuss their challenges and their progress in overcoming those challenges. Another course we offer is Basics, a six-week course for families with a child or an adolescent who has experienced mental illness. We also have a monthly support group for families on the third Thursday of every month. Please call NAMI Hunterton at 908-284-0500 for more information about any of our programs or to join. NAMI Hunterton, the voice for mental health in Hunterton County. 
When it matters most, our award-winning team of emergency physicians and nurses provides sophisticated care 24 hours a day. Superior emergency care at a moment's notice. Hundred and Health Care, your full circle of care. Okay, we're back and uh, here again with uh, Bob King, who's the co-owner of Lone Eagle, a local craft brewery located in Stengel Road, Flemington, New Jersey, uh, not too far from here. Uh, Bob is responsible for all the production, engineering, IT, and all the things technical with the brewery. Prior to starting Lone Eagle Brewing, uh, Bob spent 26 years with AT&T, Lucent, Alcatel, Lucent, I guess all their iterations, and seven years with Merck. Most of those years, uh, leading teams delivering a variety of complex IT solution. And before we start, too, we thank him because he also hosts the meetups for Hack Hunterdon uh, monthly at the uh, the last Thursday of the month. Seven o'clock, the first beer is free. Well, it's not free. We're not allowed to give out. Call it the Hack Hunterdon. The first, the, if the first beer is, you don't have to pay for it. That's right. So Other people are paying for it. That is correct. To uh, be technically. Mark correct. Salk, the uh, director of the uh, Hunterdon Economic um, Group. Development. Here. Development, thank you. Uh, they, they actually sponsor that and, and, and purchase the beer for everyone. So it makes – I'm a techie, right? So we don't charge for the space because I just enjoy it. I love yeah. the conversations. Uh, it, it's actually been, I think, very successful so far. Yeah, uh, we've had 31, I think, 31 meetups. Yeah. Yeah. So it's – And uh, I'm uh, even the summer times, it might get a little bit softer. I, I'm, I'm enthused by the, the turnout. It's consistent. We're usually 20 to 30 people that show up. The yeah. topics have varied significantly, um, and we encourage anyone that has a topic and that yeah. wants to talk, just yeah, uh, it just uh, contact me, contact Mark Salek. Uh, we're kind of coordinating the the events. Uh, next month, we're going to do an interesting event with you, right? We're going to do the beer. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> you already forgot about it. I do. Yeah. We're so going to try to create. <laughs> I think, but it was my idea. So basically, what I want to do is um, have Bob give us a little talk about how he makes the beer, even though. We all have to go through the tour, and if you want to drink beer there and stuff, but um, to kind of go over where he's at, where he's going to be with the new building, because they're building a new building, kind of give us an update on that, and then bring out some flavors and, you know, the hops and the barleys and the other things you add to your beers, and we'll come up together, we'll create like a, a poll, and we'll all create a Hack Hundred in brew, and then uh, Bob will brew it, and batch it up and then we'll try and get the next month the next month will, it'll be available for uh, for everyone to taste uh, so yeah we'll, we'll break out some raw ingredients some of the moss where people can actually see them smell them taste them see what those different flavors impart in the beer right. and uh, we'll come up with some of the ingredients and I'll work with our head brewer who's, who's really good at this uh, um, in fact there's there's two small batches that I just did recently and yeah. I brewed one with the mayor of Flemington <laughs> Um, she likes Belgian style, so we did a Belgian pale ale, and uh, she wanted to do it something. I said, well, it's summertime. Let, let's, let's come up with a fruit. Let's throw a fruit in there. So we did a raspberry puree, and I had a taste the other night, and it was just like drinking raspberry soda. It was <laughs> very light. It's about 5%. It's the least beer-tasting beer I think I've made. Oh, wow. Uh, but it was, it's, it was extremely refreshing, uh, a little bit of sweet and tartness from the raspberries and the yeast. It was just – Yeah, I like the Belgian myself. That and the uh – the stout, like your uh, chocolate milk stout, yeah. That we're is, enjoying. Uh, well, definitely, we're yes. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, uh, you know, I guess uh, thank you for uh, bringing some uh, samples well, here. Well, it's almost 4th of July, right? Yeah. Let's start the weekend off right. And uh, the other one I bring right here on Main Street is uh, Main Street Manager, uh, Manor. Tim Bebal is the uh, the host there. Okay. Uh, he runs that, and him and his wife, Marissa, and uh, they came over. They wanted to have a beer that they could give as, a, as samples to their customers that come mm -hmm. in. And I said, well, let, let's, let's brew a beer. So we did a California Common. Uh, he wanted something that was uh, bacony, a little smoky, so we added some smoke malt <laughs> to it. And uh, I'm going to be uh, finishing that up this weekend. So we're going to oh, wow. crash it, carve it up. And uh, I think that's real interesting. That should be a good beer. So I'm, I'm encouraging Tim to do it on a quarterly basis. Do something seasonal, something interesting. Yeah, so sure. something he can – and it, because it's a collaboration with us, he can help promote us. We help promote him. It's, it's a great way for us local businesses – uh, to collaborate and support each other. So let's back up. So how did you get involved in this? I mean, you're doing IT stuff or you're, you know, working in a cubicle, you know, you're doing the Dilbert lifestyle, you know, put, put project, IT project, IT project. Well, how I, did you get into this? Well, I was, well I've been home brewing um, since the mid-90s. A okay. um, little bit of history on that. If, uh, 
in New Jersey, uh, you could make wine at home, but not until about the mid 90s. I think it was around 94, 95. There was a little word left out of a New Jersey <laughs> uh, law that says you can make wine at home, but they left that little word beer out. So legally, mm. you were not allowed to make beer at home. And I remember talking to people. I was like, I, at that time, oh, I was that's well, crazy. I, I, how do you do this? It didn't make sense. But once they opened it up, then there, if you remember, in the 90s, there was all these craft brew stores star starting up because everyone wanted to get into the business here in New Jersey. The internet wasn't quite where it is today, where you can go online and order this stuff or figure it all out. Um, I read a few books, ended up uh, going to different stores, getting kits, and started uh, brewing. Charles Papazian wrote a book, uh, Home Brewing, mm -hmm. and he's considered the godfather of home brewing. So uh, the very first brew I did, it's called Rocky Raccoon Tunny Lager. It's like one of the best beers I've made. Huh. And I always tell people, your first beer is always your best. Same with the mayor, right? Should be brutal with that. So your first beer is always your best, right? And uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I've been doing it on and off for the last since since the mid '90s. Um, uh, Merck uh, decided to, to send my job overseas, uh, so I was kind of in between gigs. And uh, my partner Todd uh, Becker, who approached me, and at that time he just said, "Hey, I'm going to open up a brewery here in Flemington." Hmm. And I'm like, "Awesome!" My first reaction is, "I just got this great severance check." I said, "Are you <laughs> looking for an investor?" He's yeah. like, "No, no, no, I'm good." I said, "Well, you're looking for help. I'm not doing anything right now. I'll give you a hand." He goes, "No, no, no, I'm good." I said, "Okay." Two weeks later, he's knocking on my door. He goes, "Yeah, I need help." Yeah. And so that's when we, we uh, created a partnership, um, did all of our, our, our legalese, get everything signed up, and uh, that's how it started. So uh, I was responsible for all the uh, equipment and um, uh, identifying what vendors. We, we actually engaged with a consultant that said, look, these are the things you need. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the equipment is actually made in China. And, and you can go direct and buy that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but my view on that, this is the first time I had ever done anything of this nature. Uh, I'm familiar with home brewing. Going from right. home brewing to commercial brewing is totally different. World. Very, very different. So much more processes, so much more equipment. Um, so uh, I, I decided I'm not going to go overseas. I'm going to deal with somebody in the U.S. And they may source it from overseas, but mm -hmm. if I have a problem, I call it one throat to choke. I'm going one <laughs> place. They can't. If I can get vendor uh, fermenters from one vendor, a brew house from a third. I, mm -hmm. Now I know how to deal with that. At that time, I said, yeah. no, I don't want finger points. So, no, that's their problem. That's no, 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 that's not a problem. Sure. Right? So I went to one vendor, and, and, and that's how. Uh, so we selected a vendor. Um, it took a while to get all that stuff ordered. Um, Todd did all the, the paperwork and getting it through. Um, all and, the and legalese so, for alcohol sales and all this stuff. Yeah, so you got to file with the feds, and you got to get the fed approval first, and they want to look at where the money's coming from because mm -hmm. they don't want any illegal, yeah. you know, get it from your, your, uh, your, your, your friends who may have had the illicit connections yeah. or whatever. So everything we had we had to demonstrate where the money was coming from. And since it's two of us, it's easy. It's just uh, Todd and his wife and, and myself and my wife, we're all partners in this. And uh, so we got through that relatively without pain. Uh, then once you get that, then you go through the state and then you get approval from the state. And the state loves to say no to everything. So <laughs> I remember the state coming through and asking, we, we, we're, we're asking a ton of questions. And every question we ask, we get the response, yeah, no. <laughs> um, no, that's a, that's an interesting question. We're not sure about that. So, no. Yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> It's like when you request for permission, you're really seeking a denial. So we learned, <laughs> I, after about 15 minutes, I, I looked at Todd and gave him the wing and said, no more questions. Yeah. <laughs> so we decided we didn't want to hear what, we, you know, what, what the answer was already going to be. So uh, what, one of the interesting challenges we had starting up, though, what did we want to name this thing? And so using my IT <laughs> background, I set up a website called namethebrewery.com. Oh, okay. And we wanted to get the community engaged. We thought we'd get a handful of names, and some yeah. of our silly friends obviously listed some, some names. Um, but we got close to 500 names. And not only did we want a name, but the people had to write a name, but they had to have a story because there's got to be something behind the name. There's, right, that's, right. that's the romance, right? That's, that's, that's right, you have to have a story to tell. Exactly. Because everybody makes beer. And well, you know, what they do, and, you, and yeah, I go yeah, every yeah. place I go. I said, why? some names are obvious, right? And others are not. And you want to say, well, yeah. what's behind the name? Why did you name it this? So people come to us, and so the, actually, the very first name we picked, and, and so we we took the four hundred, we went through them, and we narrowed it down to ten. And then I updated the website, and we had people vote on it. Mm -hmm. And the number one, uh, the winner was Conspiracy Brewing, and we oh. were going to name that. So if you've ever been to the brewery, we got the downstairs and the loft. The downstairs, we were going to call it the Lunar Scape, you know, because oh, okay. all of those theories about actually yeah, yeah, landing yeah, yeah. on the moon. <laughs> Upstairs would have been the book repository. You know, oh, okay. So or the grassy had, knoll. <laughs> exactly. So we had yeah. all these the, all these uh, uh, things. We we're going to make beers after all yeah. these things. And so we went to get the, the name trademarked, and we uh, just missed it by about 45 days from the 
group uh, up, in, um, up in Massachusetts. Somebody had already actually registered the domain name and I was trying to buy it from him and he's out in Colorado and he works out of his house. Uh, and he's like, I call him up and I'm like, look, we, we want this, can we, can we pay for it? He goes, no, no, I've already uh, got my labels done and I've patented my labels and I'm like, yeah, yeah, you copyright label and you don't pay yeah. them. <laughs> so he, I, and he had no idea that somebody up in Massachusetts just locked in the uh, trademark. I said, this guy has no idea what's coming at him. So once you have the trademark, it's yeah. yours. And, and so uh, the second name, which was which is a great name and we love it, it's Lone Eagle Brewing. And the, the connection with, with Flemington, we didn't want to call it 100 and Brewing, or that's already taken by a distributor, or Flemington yeah. Brewing because we wanted to have something that could, could spread. If, it, if right. it, it's become successful and wanted it, to be known of just beyond Flemington. Um, so Lone Eagle uh, is the name we, we selected. And many people know Lone Eagle or, or Charles Lindbergh for the trial that took place here sure. last century. And that was kind of what a lot of the history in Flemington's are based on and, and is well known for. Uh, so uh, Charles Lindbergh's hall name or, or code name as a pilot was called Lone Eagle. Okay. And so yep. that, is, that is the connection. And, and so uh, we like it. And of course, our, our, our logo was a picture of an actual eagle to show that. And, and so our tagline is bold, brave, and adventurous. Those are the things that I think Charles Lindbergh really embraced clearly when he crossed the Atlantic as the yeah. first uh, single solo flight. And uh, we try to em embrace that. In, in Were you the th are you the oldest brewery? That, who, are there any other brewers in Hunterdon that are older than you? Yeah, there's uh, actually who are the uh, in Hunter uh So Conclave uh, over in Minioka, and they were they were okay, ahead of us for about a year. So they're a craft brewery, and I think they're moving in that same area. But the oldest, in fact, the very first uh, legal, um, or I, I should say, I guess legal, or, or to establish a brewery in New Jersey was the Ship Inn. Oh. The Ship Inn up in Milford, uh, right on the Delaware River. There was a big race. So right, remember I was talking about yeah. 1995 when or four when, when yeah, they yeah. passed the law. All these brew pubs were racing. Who was going to be the first one to create a brewery? Shipping was number two, followed by I think it was Trap Rock and Berkeley. There's a, a third one. They were they were like within weeks of each other. But oh, okay. I believe the shipping was the actually first one. I forgot about the shipping. Yeah, yeah. They, they've yeah. they've been around for <laughs> yeah for a long yeah, time. They've been, they have an interesting uh, uh, brewing system. Theirs is open fermentation. So what that means is, um, and it's it's I think because. Uh, the original owner was from England. He got one of those traditional, more English. So it's style. like a just open vat. Of it, it is when you ferment. So you have to have a yeast we call high phosphorylation. It's got to create the foam. And so when you have foam um, riding on top, none of that foreign bacteria can get in and spoil your beer. Oh, okay. And but he looks at now. He wishes he had stuff that we because you, you're kind of limited. You're tied yeah. into what you can make then at that point. And so they have certain yeast they can deal with and I think they're trying to experiment and expand on some of the, the malts and, and things of that nature. Okay. Uh, well, we're up at a break here so let's uh, take a quick break and then when we come back we'll talk about some of the technical things that you've had to do in the brewery, some of the uh, hardware, software stuff that you um, talked about with me earlier. So let's do a quick break here. USA Radio News with Tim Berg. White House Economic Advisor Larry Kudlow says the Trump administration is optimistic about trade talks with China, but they've still got a lot to work out. We are hoping that China will tow its end of it by um, purchasing a good many of American uh, imports, uh, agriculture, agriculture services, maybe industrial, maybe energy. Uh, it's not done yet, but we're hopeful. Kudlow was speaking to reporters outside the White House. Now the president has backed off a threat to impose another round of tariffs on Chinese imports as the two sides continue to work out a trade deal. Edward Gallagher, the Navy SEAL, found not guilty of war crimes but found guilty of taking a photo of himself with a dead ISIS fighter, was sentenced by a military panel to a reduction in grade, four months confinement that was already served, and four months partial pay. And you're listening to USA Radio News. Do you have an idea for an invention or new product? Do you think companies would be interested in your idea? Do you want to try to get a patent? Then call InventHelp now. InventHelp keeps your idea confidential and explains every step of the invention process. We create professional materials representing your idea and submit it to companies who are looking for new ideas. We have more than 9,000 companies who have agreed to review ideas in confidence. If a company shows interest in manufacturing your invention, we can negotiate on your behalf. We have helped over 10,000 clients receive patents 
patents. We also offer services including 3D modeling and animation demonstrating your idea, prototyping services, and we use state-of-the-art technology to show and vet help client ideas to additional companies. Join the thousands of people just like you who chose InventHelp to pursue their idea. We are experienced. We are working for you. We are InventHelp. Call us for free information at 1-800-460-1663. That's 1-800-460-1663. Again, 1-800-460-1663. All right, we're back. A quick uh, weather update. Um, so I'll refresh the screen, see if the weather has changed. And, oh, it's one degree warmer, so it's 86. Again, thunderstorms coming in probably tonight. Uh, at least one or two thunderstorms in the area. High near 88 tonight, patchy fog after 2 a.m., so watch out if you're out late. And uh, tomorrow it's going to be isolated showers, thunderstorms after 1. So uh, if you have the parades in the morning, I know we have ours in Lebanon Borough. Uh, starting at 9, in, I guess the fire trucks wake us up at 8 in the morning. They go around town waking everybody up and getting ready for the parade, and then they still don't come around till like 10, so you have a couple hours to get your chairs ready out on the hill. Um, but then uh, there's still a chance that uh, we'll have some firework issues, but it looks like we'll probably survive because it's only 20% chance. So, um, And that's it. So let's get back to with Bob. Um, we're going to talk about... Um, what kind of technology he uses at the brewery. So let me pull up his microphone. That would help. <laughs> Go ahead, Bob. So what, what is, so you talked about the, one of them was the keg tracker. So why don't you tell me about that? So when we started off, we were self-distributing. And so we were out there, as, as most startup craft breweries of our size tend to do. Um, there's, uh, distributors are a little reluctant to sign on to because they don't know, well, you don't have a brand name. You don't have a presence in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. How well is your beer going to be received? Uh, so they said, start off self-distribute, build a brand, and then come have a conversation. Of course, they like that because you've now established a market for them. And right. They, they well, they don't want to waste their time. You yeah. Know? <laughs> well, yeah. So uh, we are. So our first year, uh, we were self-distributing, and what you have to realize is kegs are assets, and they're expensive assets, and you want to make sure you keep track of who has them. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it started off as as we would go out to our customers, and we would drop off a keg. So I wrote a mobile app because we always carry a mobile phone mm -hmm. uh, with us and I decided well, let's write a mobile app every time we drop it off we'll track what we dropped off and when we pick it up we track what we picked up right and that worked relatively well to start with and then we realized well what if we were to extend that take it further upstream so that you know we could place an order and let the brewer know we played us an order with the customer and then they could fill the keg then we would be notified when the keg was filled and when well, we know it was ready to be delivered mm -hmm. and, and then continue tracking the keg. Uh, so I took that uh, all the way up to a fulfillment. So all the finished beer that we make goes into the app and then we know what's available for sale. I remember going to one customer and I brought some growlers and they tasted the wares and like, okay, what do we need <laughs> to do business? And I said, yeah. all I need is your ABC number. It's your alcohol beverage control. And they said, oh, so it goes to the wall, he puts it down, he goes, here's my number. I break out my phone. I put in their name, I put in their phone number, right. the customer name, phone number, <clears throat> put in their ABC number, and he's like, and I just went in and, and hit the beer, and I said, how much you want? And he's like, what'd you just do? I said, well, I just created you as a customer, and I just ordered your beer for you. And he looked at me, and <laughs> goes, you gotta be kidding. I said, you gotta get this to other breweries, because this is, I said, oh, they don't have that? And he goes, no, so. Oh, because you don't have to have fill out paperwork, and just, you know, okay, I'm a restaurant, I wanna buy your beer, so then I gotta fill out all my credit information and all the W-9, and you get that from their ABC number. I get that, well that's because I have, when I do my reporting to the state, I have to show who I sold the beer to and it has to be legitimate. Right. So we sell th things to them as, in terms of wholesale, I don't tax them, um, but I need to know, the state wants to know who you're selling your beer to and they want to make sure that who they're selling them to consumers, right. how much did I sell, so they like to track alcohol very, very carefully. Yeah, yeah. And for lots of good reasons, so we, we, that's what we, we created the software to do that. Um, and it, it works quite well. Now, there's probably stuff in the marketplace to do that, but A, I have the capabilities. Right. B, I'm cheap because we're a startup. I'm trying to save money wherever we can. And so for me to spin up a server, and so in fact, it's connected directly to our website. We, our website, which basically is out in the world that shows here's the beers, here's what's on tap, although it might be a little dated right Did now. Did you still have those little Bluetooth um, buttons or whatever? They, 
you were talking about using? Oh, I'll get that. That's the geopositioning stuff. Oh, okay. Yeah. The, the, we've implemented that as well. Okay, so that's separate from the keg tracker. That's separate. So that's just okay. for, I was thinking of, of implementing something like RFID to track or putting a little barcode. But these kegs get beat up. We run them through a lot of cleaning process, getting something in a place that's going to be secure that someone's not going to rip it off or it's not going to wash off over time. So those things. To, but it would be great just to scan it saying this is going in or have an RFID yeah. that with your phone. That well, RFIDs are getting pretty good at uh, – I actually work for a company that uh, did RFID tags. They're down in Princeton, and they do – they did a big luggage test at Newark Airport, and they passed, and they do um, – their tag was more robust because of how it's made. It's flexible. So they, they were talking about doing garment tags and things like oh, that. Oh, interesting. So if I I can we can talk it, later about that. I don't know how that works because the, the, the kegs are stainless steel, right? Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if the metal – Well, they were doing containers. They were talking about doing them for container for the ports. And just as long as you have them on the outside. I mean the, the well, issue is more about the antenna. So if you had the antenna built into the inside of your delivery truck – then as you pass it through that antenna, it's going to read. So as soon as it leaves your truck, you know where, you know, you know the GPS of the truck, so you know you're at the ship in or you know right, the, right, right. the Milford restaurant or whatever, and you know it'll. You could assume that it left the truck to go be delivered to the restaurant. I, yeah, maybe I need to revisit this technology. Yeah. Been, but that's that's stuff like that. Just whatever makes life easier. Yeah. And now we have a distributor. And so it's less important. We still have okay. a handful of house accounts, we call them, um, but we have distributed them. We're now in, in PA uh, as well. Oh, uh, wow. Outside of Philly. Um, so that's what the keg tracker did. And so it was really our, from a finished beer good all the way through to tracking our case and delivery, signing up customers, it became less important as we got distributors, but we still have a dozen accounts that we like to track with. Um, so but the how do you do that then? You you use that data though. You're using it to determine how popular beer was and know how, quickly how to I'm, schedule yeah, your yeah. beer. So schedule. we know how quickly it's moving. Uh, it, it's a great way to track uh, beers that are fast selling, things that are slower selling. What do we need to? What's going to run out? How long before we need to brew it again? If we're going to brew right. it again? Uh, so we have some staples that we keep on. All so the what's time. the what's the spread? Like if you take your most popular beer and your least popular beer, like are we talking like months of consumption or? So our, I would say What's we good? did <laughs> probably one of our two beers that we just put on, and it, it, it's hard to judge because something that's on all the time and have to track it by the particular batch, which becomes okay. a little bit more challenging. Uh, but things that we've done one off on, we just did a summer blonde with a local honey. Uh, yeah, that was very good. I had that at the uh, uh, that, last meetup. Yeah, that we brewed less than a month ago, and so uh, that was probably I, I would say our quick beers go in about six weeks. For, for and that's 10, how many gallons in a batch? 310 gallons. Okay. And so um, I'd have to uh, convert So that's about uh, 2,400 so, pints? Yeah, so it's quite a bit. Uh, now, some of that will get to our distributor once some of that, and the restaurants hear about it, and they say, yeah. But it's still we'll, people are drinking it, so it's like it's a roughly 2,400 yeah. drinks, per se, you know. And so that, and we did a mango milkshake IPA that just went, went over really well. We're going to brew that one again. We're tweaking that base recipe because we have some other interesting ideas we want to do with this milkshake concept that, that others have not yet done. But uh, huh. uh, our brewer is excited to, to, to do that. Um, so, yeah, the web, so the, the, the apps we've developed, even though it's on a mobile phone, it all integrates into our website. So our mm -hmm. brewer could be doing a new beer, go to his mobile phone, edit his new beer, and say it's now on tap, and it would show up on the website. So mm. the database, they're all integrated, the mobile phone app and the database. Uh, so you were asking about the geopositioning earlier. So if you remember on one of my presentations for the Hack 100 in which we didn't complete, <laughs> uh, was uh, the, actually the first Hack 100 in which is, I called it My Town, which would allow um, consumers as they walk by storefronts that say, hey, you're near me, let me give you a, a coupon or some incentive. Yeah. Uh, and so I've actually implemented that at the brewery. So uh, when you download the app, and downloading apps, everyone knows, painful now. I got enough yeah. apps on my phone. Why do I need another? Exactly. One? And what incentive am I going to get by downloading your app? So what we do is, we, we if you download the app, and I have to put the new release out yet, you would get a coupon that would give you fifty percent off of Pint or a Flight. Now and that was only initially Apple, right? That's right. But um, do you well, have it on Android then? I've, Android is interesting animal. I'm I'm working on that. I'm oh. looking at different languages and platforms. So I've been playing with Flutter and versus oh, okay. native. Uh, so I'm a Pixel phone user myself, oh, so right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so I, it I, has so, to be Android or else I won't uh, download. I know there's a lot of people out there. I've been trying to get them to say, hey, I, I have 
the iOS. You know, there's a whole high school right down the road here, and I'm sure there's more than just Lorenzo. Yes. Who <laughs> Somebody can do an iPad, an Android. I, look, I'll give. Just, them, here's the APIs you got to run through. I said, here's the keys to get to yeah, the APIs. Yeah. Just come over to the brewery, even though you're not 21. We will. Just yeah. you know, yeah, you can. You you're legally allowed to be in the brewery. You just can't drink. That's correct. Just find Bob if you want to get your. Uh, <laughs> you want to do an Android free, app? You know, it's it's basically a quick way to add a resume builder right there. Do some volunteer work. Because I know like high school students need volunteer hours for National Honor Society. This would be a perfect opportunity if anybody out there is from Fleming, you know, from one of the high schools that wants to do programming. And if it works, and uh, I'll, look, I'll give you the APIs, I'll give you the rundown of it, and uh, we might be able to throw in some money to help you go to college or something like that, give you yeah. a little incentive, so. Yeah, no, it's definitely, I think I, I'm all, I'm big on that, especially because we saw it from our own uh, child's you know, side of it, because he's into filmmaking, and so he uh, volunteered to do the Habitat for Humanity to film their building houses. Oh, wow, cool. So, and it was a way for him to get service hours to get into the Honor Society. And that was, um, you know, because it's hard when you, if you have somebody who doesn't, you know, he's, he, you can kind of lead him to do some charitable stuff, but it's something that he's passionate about. So it was like perfect mix for him. And so... He filmed them building the houses. He interviewed families. He interviewed some of their uh, charity stuff. They do like a fun run. And then he pared everything down to like five-minute videos for them so they could use to sell the, the service. And so use that as I always oh, tell people, you know, that, I especially in your yeah, line yeah, of work. Yeah. I mean, even though you can't have them come as customers, they could definitely. Look, the basic app is simple. Right? But when we get yeah. into we have a few beacons in there when you start doing some of the geopositioning that starts getting the other challenging piece that we do. Uh, one of the fun things we love to do at the brewery is get our customers engaged. Right. And so uh, there's a feature in there and that was this past year's, yeah. not this pre but the previous year, yeah. heck I don't know where we were doing real time polling. Right. So we call it tap it or dump it where customers can come in and we put on a small batch yeah, of Yeah, let's beer. say it again because that's a good name. Tap, tap it, it or, or dump, dump it. it. And by the way, I have that trademark. So, <laughs> there you go. I went out and said, that I, when I talked to some people, they said, this is a great idea. I said, I better go trademark yeah. the idea. So I do. I have that trademark. Wow, great. Um, so we want to have our consumers come in, use their phone, and, and vote. And if you say, yeah, we love it, tap it, the next dialogue that comes up or the next prompt that says, well, why don't you give us a name? And then we would vote on the name. So then yeah. it becomes really customer engaging. It's just kind of fun things to do. And, and I think that's what makes us a little different than a lot of other brewers because, one, I, I, I'm, I'm a techie, right? I right, love right. this stuff. I've been involved with it. I've been doing it for years and years. Graduated as an engineer. Yeah. Got a master in computer science. So I just, I just it's hard but for it's me. But it's more to than just software. Like you have um, in your cold room, you're, you, have, you use Raspberry Pi. So now you're talking hardware, not just software. Yeah. A number of years ago, somebody turned me on to this, and it was like a Linux, and I, I'm a big Unix guy. AT&T, yeah. you know, so when they come up with Linux and they put it on, a, on the size of a credit card and then they give you some I.O., I said, wow, the world is now open. You can do all kinds of fun things. Yeah. And so one of the things we built early on, uh, I custom built our cold room. And so I wanted to make sure it was going to be stable. Right. And so I had it polling every 30 seconds or a minute, what's the temperature of your cold room? And if, if something went wrong... Right. I would get an alarm. I'd get a text message on my phone saying, hey, your cold room's unusually warm. You might want to check it out. Yeah. And so, yeah, the Raspberry Pi, you built in these uh, 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 temperature sensors and UI, this basic I.O. To, to, and then I connected it to, a, to Wi-Fi and had it broadcast up to my website so mm -hmm. I could actually open up a web page and say, here's the last 24 hours. Here's all the, uh, the readings that, that took place. Nice. Okay, so um, we need to take a quick break here and then... We'll get right back to finish up with Bob, and then also we have to do a, we'll do our little historical innovation story, and then we'll be done. So again, this hour is flying by today. So uh, let me get the commercials going. Oh, wow. folks, you know what that music is? That's the time for modern design. This blue thing is a really new trend. A lot of the designers are trying to introduce blue as a new cabinet color. This is topical for you guys. <laughs> this is really topical. And the mother said, well, I'd like her room to be gray. And, and the little girl said, Mom, gray is the color of depression. <laughs> Hi, this is Rich Scuderi of Modern Design. We're on live every Wednesday from 2 to 3, and you're listening on WHCR-DB. You're listening to WHCR-DB, HuntertonChamberRadio.com. Brought to you by the Hunterdon County Chamber of Commerce, the voice of business. 
For over 50 years, Hunterdon Medical Center has been a leader in delivering comprehensive medical and health services to our community. Our staff is committed to providing the highest quality of care to our patients. If you need a physician, we can refer you to over 300 of the best. Call Hunterdon Medical Center's Physician Referral Service at 1-800-511-4HMC or visit us on the web at www.hunterdonhealthcare.org. When it matters most, our award-winning team of emergency physicians and nurses provides sophisticated care 24 hours a day. Superior emergency care at a moment's notice. Hundred and Health Care, your full circle of care. All right, we're back. And again, we're here with Bob uh, King, who's the co-owner of Lone Eagle Brewery. And we were talking about his brewery and, and uh, the apps that he uses. So what do you have in development for the future? So one of the things uh, we... Reporting is a, is a critical part of what we have to do with the state and this if, uh, and for the, for the federal government. Uh, so we talked about finished goods through the keg tracking. I'm going further upstream. So now um, it, it's funny. Some of the the uh, vendors we order our our raw materials from our our malts, our hops, yeast, and that nature. Some of them have decent websites others are send me an email of what you want <laughs> and so I'm like well now that now, now I'm starting to think how do I leverage that to my advantage right so uh, what I'm doing is starting from allowing my brewer to go in and say I'm gonna brew these beers I need these raw materials or the raw materials from my website that I that I built it's gonna send an email off to the vendor and then when the, it arrives he says yes it's there now it's added to our inventory now I have an inventory tracker and when he brews a recipe with those goods, it's going to pull it out of inventory. So now I have a whole inventory management system. Oh, wow. And so from if I ever get an order, I can say, well, here's the brews I've done. Here's the, the thing. Yeah. And then in addition to that, we're going to start tracking um, the beers as they're going through the process. Are we, and there's certain data we want to collect. So I can go online and see, okay, oh, my favorite no, chocolate no. stout is uh, only two weeks away. Oh, that's actually, that's a great idea. Actually, there I can do that. And so, yeah, why um, not? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking about, no, we want to know the pH especially levels. Especially like those rum barrel age ones. Oh, those are the best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So our <laughs> anniversary beer is coming up, and that's going to be a special beer. And uh, that's yeah. aged in bourbon barrels. But it's going to be a lighter beer for the summer. Like a uh, countdown clock, you know? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a, that's a great idea. So, uh, but we uh, we want to do it for so as a beer is going through fermentation, is it on track? We yeah. compare it to previous brews. Are we ahead or behind fermentation schedule? Okay. Did, did we finish out at the same gravity level that we wanted to as previous one? So we're going to start get, right now. We've done everything. It's been fundamentally paper based, mm -hmm. and I want to get it completely automated. Okay, and then. Um, you also are expanding physically as a building, right? We are. We, uh, it's a good problem to have, <laughs> right? So one of the things, uh, we're out of space. If you've been to the brewery and you look inside in the evenings, you see the, our, our, our brewing area is filled with raw materials, cans, things of that nature. We just, we're not able to keep up. We, we're, 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 we're yeah, cutting Yeah, it's a back. great problem to have. It's a great problem to have. And so um, I'd rather have this problem than the other problem. So the building right next door to us, we're expanding our manufacturing. Fundamentally, could just be for beer to get out the door, primarily. Not our, we're keeping our tasting room. We love the tasting room. We've, we've invested a quite a bit of money into that. Uh, that stays the same. It just allows me to add more fermenters. So for people who are like me, it's not going to change. That's correct. It's just there's going to be another building that's next door that makes stuff. But there's other there's other stuff going in that building, right? On the other side that we're not involved with, and so okay. we're going to be careful from a from a ABC perspective. Okay. What I am, so Lone Eagle is not involved. There, there's been discussion of of things like an entertainment center and food court, but. We're, we're, that's a separate building on a separate property. Okay, we're, so the building that's the footprint of that building right now is only going to be your stuff. No, the footprint. So what, what you don't <laughs> see the footprint uh, and and the uh, developers who built the the property merged. So the side that's close to us, there's a private road between us that has to remain. It was deeded since 1945. Okay. Uh, on the other side of that um, is the building. Will, a third of that will is part of our same block and lot. Okay. And so it is going to be part of us. There'll be a firewall between the buildings, so there's no entrance and exit. Okay. You have to actually go outside and, and go okay. next door to the food court or whatever that's going to be. Okay. Uh, we're not involved with that. Uh, so that, that so two-thirds of that building. And when you sit down at, at, at ground level, it doesn't look that big. Uh, but when you take an aerial view, 
it's going to be a big building. So we're going to have about uh, 5,000 square feet just to add to manufacturing. Oh, wow, that's a lot. So yeah. we're going to be adding uh, uh, fermenters, uh, larger fermenters. Uh, mm. We're going to brew at our place and just pump the word over. It's not beer, it's wort. So they, okay. they, 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 the state can't get, they, were, they got all upset on, well, you can't pump beer <laughs> across the street. I said, well, it's a private <laughs> street. And of course, getting back to my statement earlier, everything's no. That's crazy. Right? Like, yeah, literally, no. like they're, they're worried that you're going from one building to another. Like that, it's a speakeasy or something. And they said, well, whatever you produce over there, you can't sell out of your place. I said, I, I, have, I said that's just for outdoor consumption. It's, we want to make it there, package it, and get it out the door. That's, that's the whole. We just can't. And, and everything that's made in our place will be continued to be consumed on premise. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we're looking at uh, um, fermenters, canning line, another cold space, barrel aging, place to store our, our raw goods. Yeah. So it just uh, uh, yeah, you're just expanding your operations. What you're exactly doing. I right. mean, it should all be one. Uh, this is a wonderful. Th but federally, that you could do that because you s you told me the one time that it's there's like a two mile radius or something that you you don't have to get even in the state you don't have to get a separate permit. You still have to file with this what you do, but you don't have to go file. I'm sorry, file for a separate license. Okay. Now, because of what I'm doing, it's a separate location. Building. They're saying you have to do this, and what becomes more confusing for the state is like well. It's one block and lot. How can you have two licenses for the same piece of price? So these yeah. are the things you have to kind of work your way through. So you think if you started over, would you have done, would you have not gone to that location? Or is that location something that was because of the, you know, in middle of Flemington, you that's know, a, probably low cost? That's a great, we wanted to do it in Flemington. We, we thought uh, at that time, if you recall, uh, I don't know how familiar you are with the Roger Brooks study, if, you, if you've heard of that here in Flemington, he, there was a consultant really. that they brought in that helps revitalize towns that Flemington, we thought, wow, this is, the, we saw the Roger Brooks and, and Roger Brooks got up and gave this wonderful presentation. He said, if you don't have a craft brewery in this town, you better get one. And we were already in the, the, on, the, okay. on the way of doing that. So we really thought we were right on the, the, the very tip of the wave we're going to catch this wave yeah. that's going to help this town help revive. So we still believe in Flemington. We still believe it's going to uh, turn around. Uh, it's just uh, it's taking a little longer than expected. Yeah. Okay. So um, before I run out of time here, I just wanted to, as I promised, some innovation stories from the past. So uh, I found the top five uh, innovators from our founding fathers in honor of uh, the 4th of July weekend. So number five, according to – this is Alex Knapp's uh, list – from Forbes. Um, number five is George Washington. Um, everybody knows him as the you know first president, but he also was the inventor of the threshing barn. So he created a method for threshing wheat that was safer and easier using a, um, a barn that was shaped in like a hexagon shape. Huh. And um, it was it was a safer way. Uh, it was a, actually it was not hexagon. It was 16-sided barn where the horses would thresh the grain in a circle on the second second level of the barn. The horses were made to continually run so they wouldn't go to the bathroom on the grain, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and there were gaps in the floor that the, the treaded wheat would then come out through for easy collection. So he created a, a method for that. Um, number four was Ben Franklin for his bifocals. Everybody knows about Ben Franklin inventing the bifocals. But not electricity. So well, he didn't invent electricity. Um, that's later. We'll tell you about that. Uh, number three was Thomas Jefferson for his cipher wheel. So the cipher wheel, which is like a code-making device, uh, Thomas Jefferson actually oh, invented one cool. um, that's actually attributed to a French uh, person but um, because he never really marketed it per se. So it ended up becoming more of a French invention. Uh, Thomas Paine, actually the one who wrote um, Common Sense, He's famous for the, the second ever Iron Bridge. Uh, up until, you know, the 1700s, bridges were made of stone or wood. And he's like, well, we can make an Iron Bridge. So he actually had the longest Iron Bridge at one point. And, um, well, that's, uh, they had a facilities to actually manufacture iron. Right. It was uh, uh, back in, uh, it was a 240-foot span wow. that opened in England over the Ware River. And it was open until 1927, before they had to replace it. That's so that's impressive. a couple hundred years. Wow. Um, that was just had to be wrought iron. I mean, they, they and his other thing that was really interesting about him is that common sense sold to four percent of the United States population. So if you correlate that to today, that's 14 million books. And 
no book sold more than a million copies last year. So imagine that's how popular Common Sense was. Wow. So talk about your viral hit. And that was within three months he sold that many copies, 120,000 copies. Um, and then, of course, Benjamin Franklin for the lightning rod. Ah. So that's what he was um, – but Dude, I didn't even read your stuff, and I, I kind of guessed. So, what but was number who's, one? That was well, that was number one. But who do you think the only president? There's only one president that has a patent. Do you know who it is and what it's for? Oh, oh, oh that's a trivia question. I believe um, wasn't it Harding? We're running out of time. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Dave is waiting in the wings. It's Abraham Lincoln. Really? He has a patent for a. Uh, a way to lift boats over shoals and sandbars because his boat got stuck on a sandbar and he figured, hey, let's create these air chambers that lift up the boat and bring you over the sandbar. How clever. The so only president. Yeah. yeah, the only I'm president. Sure he with Donald that. Trump. He's got plenty to use. Well, <laughs> well, he didn't have time for that. It, you know, <laughs> he's busy, uh, you know, making everything great again. So, all right. So quick thank you to everybody. Bob King, thank you for coming. Happy and to be here. Thank you to all the fans on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, thank you to the Chamber. Uh, Mark, the gang back at Zero Surge, uh, my family, and the rest of you innovators out there. Again, the original meaning of innovator was that you were a rebel. So keep rebelling against the doubters and make your ideas a reality. USA Radio News with Tim Berg. As preparations continue for the solution.